did you know that India signaled its ideological pivot away from socialism to market-based reforms in 1980? This was captured in the sixth five-year plan presented in 1980. And did you know that the member secretary of the planning commission then was Manmohan Singh? And now the wow fact. Did you know in the concluding session of the 17th Lok Sabha, Prime Minister Narendra Modi presented a strong defense of economic reforms. It's the first time, especially one from a government that is facing two-term anti-incumbency, is making such a strong defense of economic reforms. Hello and welcome to another edition of Capital Calculus. I am your host, Anil Padmanabhan. Last month, addressing the concluding session of the 17th Lok Sabha, Prime Minister Narendra Modi did something unthinkable, which is not part of any politician's playbook. He has put up a strong defense of economic reforms and then went on to argue that it was a guiding principle of his government. Right and identified it as reform, perform, transform. This was no one-off. Earlier, the President's address to both Houses of Parliament as well as the white paper presented by Nirmala Sitharaman to both Houses of Parliament put up a similar defense of economic reforms. This government is seeking to link its ability to deliver development for all to the push for economic reforms. All this just weeks before the general election cycle kicks in. Now, no government in the past has dared to approach the electorate with a manifesto that includes a defense of economic reforms. But here, the NDA is seeking to go against the tide as it were. So what do we make of this dare? Is it hubris, the India shining of 2004, for example? Or is it signaling a mindset reset which has been long in the making? To answer this and more, I spoke to Sanjeev Sanyal. He is an economist and member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. I began by asking Sanjeev his thoughts on the white paper that the government had presented to Parliament. I think the uh, the government's economic views are now reasonably well established. And I think they came through here as well. So what are the uh, anchoring points about this government's uh, economic views? Because very often the, the, the accusation is made that uh, this is a government that's un un unintellectual. It doesn't have a clear uh, economic uh, framework of thinking. So let me lay out uh, what I uh, what uh, it is. And also, uh, once you read it uh, in the uh, white paper, if you go and relook at it, these are all uh, there clearly laid out. So the first and very important uh, part of uh, this government's uh, economic uh, management uh, strategy is macroeconomic stability. So this is very important because this is the government that inherited, you know, a fragile five economy. It then took the effort to introduce a unambiguous inflation targeting framework. And remember, India was, while it was not an Argentina type high inflation country, it was a high inflation country in the 8 to 12% annual rate kind of level. It then anchored it in the 2 to 6% range. And since then, if you see that inflation has by and large been in this range uh, on two occasions going below it and uh, one occasion going above it, but basically staying inside this range. Now, that is a 500, 600 basis point reduction in the uh, underlying inflation rate. That's not a trivial thing to do. Similarly, if you see the cleaning up of the banking system, so, um, you know, the banking system that was inherited by this government had serious uh, NPA problems. Uh, even Raghuram Rajan acknowledges that. 
and then uh, starting from 2017 18 and 19 this was cleaned up i mean i myself was very much a part of that clean up effort when i was at the finance ministry and it was cleaned up using the insolvency and bankruptcy uh, code um so you know uh, bringing it was not so it's partly a macroeconomic stabilization issue and partly a structural reform so you know it created the framework for creative destruction as well um the similarly accumulation of foreign exchange reserves there has been continuous accumulation of foreign foreign exchange reserves they now stand somewhere in the range of 620 billion dollars um the the even at the height of covid uh, you would have seen that this government didn't go out there and use up all the fiscal and monetary uh, resources it was quite judicious about its use so you can see that one article of faith is uh, macroeconomic stability and that is one of our strengths today at the end of 10 years you can see that you know not only is it stable but there are lots of buffers that have been created in different directions for unintended uh, and unpredictable situations so whether it's foreign exchange reserves or the capitalization of the banking system uh, or even bringing down the fiscal even you know you know in the middle of a uh, of an election year you are still article of faith so you are still doing fiscal consolidation through that so this is one big area the second very big area is this is a government that is unapologetically supply sider so while we do do demand management to some extent but it is done from a macroeconomic stability perspective it is not demand management is not seen as the way to generate growth the way it is done is by creating capacity so whether it is a ease of doing business or trying to attract foreign investors here pli scheme building of infrastructure uh, opening up sectors like you know a whole bunch of sectors that have been opened up in, in the last few years from drones to space so all of it is about ease of doing business getting the supply side responsive and so on so this is the growth engine part so stability part there's the growth engine part and it's unapologetically supply side we are not the guys who massage demand to generate growth okay and the third article of faith of this government is that something has to be done for the bottom so this is the point about antudaya antudaya means the rise of the people at the bottom now notice that this is fundamentally different concept than say the western idea of inequality so we are not socialists we have no problem with billionaires there's no point in telling us uh, uh, adani ambani and so on uh, our view is look india has one sixth of the world's population we should have one sixth of the world's billionaires however we do need to help the people at the very bottom and directly doing so this is not an inequality thing it is a targeting of absolute poverty and so you see what is being done you provide them with safety nets from with health insurance you help them build up their houses ghar pakka you know so the pm awas yojana you make sure the very poor have toilets they have got the cooking gas they have got a bank account and so you see you can clearly see direct targeting of absolute poverty so these are the three anchors of economic policy that this government believes in supply side keep the macroeconomic stable make sure the very poorest people are giving some support directly and all of this comes through in the white paper and i want to draw your attention to the pm's uh, final address in parliament uh, to the entire house which is basically a summation of this government's tenure and he used this very good phrase he said reform perform and transform is what our government has achieved so in my memory i don't see any government going into a general election owning reforms so proudly uh, so are we witnessing some kind of mindset reset in this country finally i think absolutely i mean so if you go back to like the original reforms of 1991 and if you read the budget speeches of 90, 92 for example where manmohan singh uh, you know is you know consolidating those original reforms uh, so Uh, you, you can see how apologetic the whole thing is um you know uh, and in the end of that speech he says you know you know let the assassins come so to speak so he can see that we are doing reforms but we are not owning them we are doing them because look we have a crisis the imf is forcing us to do this and so on and so forth and then when prime minister vajpay comes in 
uh, we do privatization but we give it you know this uh, term called disinvestment so you know we <clears throat> we invent all these euphemisms because we are apologetic about the whole thing uh, whether it's an intellectual class or our policy makers even our business community is not entirely comfortable with the business of a market based um, creative destruction based system that i think has changed um and i think that's where uh, you know uh, a lot of the momentum comes now one of the ironies is uh, because we own it and we are unapologetic about it it also means that we may occasionally do things which may be considered non market interventions but again we are unapologetic about that too because we are more uh, in a sense uh, comfortable in our skins about the whole uh, thing as you argued earlier this government has made it a slogan of pro poor and pro business and managing to tread both sides so how was this you know how is this managed i mean how has this been achieved uh, without major disruptions so of course some part of it is uh, you know top down uh, messaging from right up there from the prime minister himself so leadership is one part of it but one important thing that has happened is that i think we are lucky that we have in place a generation now particularly young people who are willing to take uh, some amount of disruption happily if they think that there is a chance that you'll benefit something in the long run from it now this requires a certain civilizational confidence right so for example whether you take um, uh, 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 insolvency and bankruptcy and the cleaning up of the banks a very messy process i had a painful thing at some level um even demonetization or introduction of gst all of these are disruptive things and yet we went through all of them almost simultaneously in a, in a, in a short period of time we did all of these things and we by the way also introduced the um, um, the monetary policy uh, framework which is a you know it's a deflationary policy so all of these are painful things to do which were done in almost at the, at the at the same time then we went through the disruption of covid as well and yet you know with, with despite some grumbling um, as a population and as a people we took it in the chin and went on and we are now getting the benefits of it so it feels good now that we are getting the benefits but the fact of the matter is we all you i the man on the street all went through this rather disruptive shocks and uh, were willing to take these changes and i think this is something that uh, cannot be wasted in a sense you know we have now a few decades i think where the general population is willing to take short term pain for long term gain and that happens very rarely in history and i think therefore i think the the political leadership quite correctly senses it and is pushing through all kinds of reforms see while the mindset reset you have walked us through but there still seem to be pockets of resistance let's take the farm laws for example which had to be rolled back almost everyone beyond the agitating farmers believed it was good for the farm economy Uh, but it had to be rolled back now there's a fresh agitation on msp so pockets of resistance continue right i mean but is this a cause for worry or it is just part of the democratic process well partly it's a part of the democratic process and so it's fair that uh, we go through it but i think um, there is also the problem of what, what is known as Man- Man- manker olson's collective action problem that when there is something that is a benefit to a large number of people but hurts a relatively small group of people who are organized then very often the small organized group will end up dictating terms even though there is a very large number of people who benefit so you know so therefore all reform is based on um you know uh, either the the larger numbers who need to organize themselves or there has to be a leadership that is willing to take on these interest groups and basically be able to explain why he is doing it uh, i would argue that this is not a unique problem by the way to india every place in the world you will have this problem 
what is interesting is that there is now a leadership in place and a population in place that is willing to allow these kinds of things to be done i mean this is also after all you know introducing the gst was also uh, a, a, a very difficult thing it there were winners and losers from that too uh, there were clear winners and losers from the insolvency and bankruptcy code there have been clear winners and losers from every you know reform we have done opening up the space sector opening up the geospatial sector opening up the drone sector there were bureaucratic departments that lost power uh, the survey of india became uh, you know lost its monopoly over uh, cartography and geospatial data at every stage there was somebody who lost but then if you push back hard enough and there is a general support then things do get done uh, after a few iterations but finally uh... Sanjeev, do you fear that uh, the special interest groups may make a comeback and force a rollback of reforms sometime later, or that tipping point has been crossed? Well, anything can be reversed, but uh, the point is that uh, I think the tipping point for at least a generation has been crossed. because we have a generation that is doing things it is benefiting from it it's it as i said we are unapologetically reformist and are willing to take some hits and risks for it now it's possible that in some distant future we will have a softer generation which has not doesn't have memories of uh, you know the 70s and 80s and of the pre liberalization era uh, you will have uh, you know you know these communist socialist type ideas coming back repackaged in some fashion and uh, you know we they will begin to begin to affect policy um and uh, you know this is what is happening for example in the us i mean sometimes some of the policies you see being advocated by uh, some us politicians and you say you've got to be kidding me this is what jyoti basu would have been proud of uh, so and this is happening in the us uh, you know us is a country be that was built on the unwillingness to pay taxes and they have ended up being a heavily taxed country you know so um so you know this this, this kind of thing happens uh, a, a different generation may take a different view of things uh, and uh, you know but for the time being i think we have a, a moment in history where uh, whether the, the popular will the leadership and the general direction of things are all aligned you heard sanjeev he is convinced that there has been a national mindset reset on the idea of economic reforms people are now willing to accept short term pain because they are convinced that there is a long term gain this mindset reset also reflects a growing trust quotient between people and the government as you know the idea of economic reforms was seeded way back in 1980 but most of the years thereafter it is a case of reforms by stealth it has taken 40 years for a government to come out so openly in support of economic reforms and that too before a general election cycle a further is a government which is facing a two term anti incumbency implicitly therefore they are seeking a referendum on economic reforms indeed There's much more at stake in the upcoming general election than a record third term for the NDA. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to Strat News Global on YouTube. Hit the bell icon so that you don't miss any updates. And please do share your thoughts, ideas, and suggestions with us. I'm available on Twitter or X as they call it now at Capital Calculus. I'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, stay safe.